The Tom Woods Show, episode 1285. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, more and more of my listeners are ditching the traditional nine to five and working on their own terms from their laptops. There are many paths you can take to make the internet work for you. And I've written an ebook on precisely the ones I've used for myself. I'll show you how you can do the same thing. Download your free copy at pathstoincome.com. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here talking today about state nullification, a topic you've heard me hit before, but it's kind of timely right now because we've heard that the uh, acting attorney general, Matthew Whitaker, apparently is very sympathetic to the idea. You could even say is outright supportive of the idea. And this, of course, had all the usual suspects up in arms, and they pulled out their seventh grade civics textbook and unbosomed all the traditional arguments against nullification we've all heard a million times before. They've all been smashed. All these arguments have been smashed over and over, but that's all we get is the same darn arguments over and over. And they're really, really low IQ arguments. So I thought, eh, what the heck? You know, I wrote a book on nullification. Why don't I say a little something about this? I wrote a book called Nullification back in 2010. And you can still get that, baby. You can get that. By the way, at tomwoods.com slash books, you can even get signed copies. And if you have not read one of my books, but you enjoy the podcast, you're getting but but 50% of the experience, my friends. And you can also get the audiobook version for free. When you sign up for Audible through TomWoodsAudio.com, you can choose Nullification as the free book you get with sign up. And then if you decide to quit Audible, you still get to keep the free book. So, hey, free book. Anyway, I wrote Nullification because I thought, what the heck, let's let's get off this three by five card of allowable opinion and let's think thoughts that the New York Times has not approved for us in advance, particularly when these thoughts are developed and supported by Thomas Jefferson who matters a teensy-weensy bit more than the New York Times editorial board. The second half of the book, Nullification, is all documents. It's speeches, it's uh, things like the Virginia-Kentucky resolutions that were actually passed through to the state legislatures. It's a wide variety of types of documents supporting the idea of state nullification. And these are documents that you won't see in any documentary reader, They won't be discussed in a high school or college classroom, but they exist. And they paint a picture of American history and constitutionalism that is so at odds with the standard view that I thought it was important just to include them verbatim, just to include them so people could reckon with them. And you see kind of an alternative America in these documents, particularly in the document by Abel Upshur. I think I mentioned him in a recent episode, but Abel Upshur, he responded to Joseph Story. You may not know who Joseph Story was, but Joseph Story followed in the tradition of John Marshall and Alexander Hamilton in believing in the nationalist theory of the Union, that the United States is fundamentally one unit with some states that are like administrative units of that one unit. And he wrote some commentaries on the Constitution in defense of that particular way of looking at the Union. Well, Abel Upshur wrote a systematic point-by-point demolition of Story's commentaries, but because he's not part of the narrative, because he's arguing for the compact theory of the Union, therefore this can't be discussed. So you can't actually know that Story was refuted. It's just there was Story, and he said these things, And that's the end of it. But the Upshur text is so important. Well, anyway, Upshur also wrote a really great pseudonymous pamphlet about nullification in which he answered all the standard objections. And it's the boring objections that you hear today were the same boring objections people had back then. And Upshur just smacked them. And when I had Phil Magnus on not too long ago to talk about his amazing discovery of two new long essays by Lysander Spooner, I pointed out that at the Columbia University Library, I just happened to stumble upon this Abel Upshur pamphlet. 
and I mean, I don't know if it was an original going back to the 1830s, but it's pretty darn old. It was definitely a 19th century work I was holding in my hands, and I had never seen it published anywhere. And I'm pretty sure for the first time in the 20th century, it came to light in my book, Nullification. I just reproduced it in the documents section. So I thought I would say a little something about uh, some comments that we've seen by, oh, heaven help us, so-called legal experts. Oh my gosh, these people are the worst. Kevin Gutzman, my friend who wrote the book, Who Killed the Constitution with Me, has both a JD and a PhD in history. And he says, never confuse legal training with an education. You're going to get a lot of case law. You're going to read a lot of cases. But you're not going to learn the history of the Constitution. You're not going to learn about the ratifying conventions. You're not going to learn any of that. You're going to learn a particular point of view that was put forth in a particular set of cases. So it's no wonder that legal experts at the various networks and law professors are all outraged at the idea of nullification. Why? They didn't learn this in law school. This can't be so. Because in law school, they got the nationalist theory of the union. Now, it wasn't pitched to them that way. I'm sure they probably never even heard the term. But that's what they read. They would read John Marshall, and they would be influenced by him and or by Story and some of the other nationalists. They would not read people like John Taylor of Caroline, St. George Tucker, Abel Upshur, Thomas Jefferson in any detail. They certainly wouldn't read the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798 and 1799. But these things are just as much a part of America as the other side. And if anything, even more so because the compact theory of the union, which I'll define in a minute, is laid out systematically much earlier than the nationalist theory is. I don't think there's a systematic exposition of the nationalist theory of the union. A systematic, not, I'm not, not there weren't people who believed in it, but there, there wasn't actually a systematic exposition of it, I think, until the 1830s. Whereas you can already see the compact theory being spoken of and spun out in the 1790s. And I happen to think that's because it happens to be true. The compact theory, in contrast to the nationalist theory, is the idea that the United States is actually a collection of societies. This is its defining characteristic. Not that it's a single, indivisible blob like all the other countries of the world, but remember this whole thing about the United States, we're different and unique and we're great, and we're number one. But 99% of the people who say that conceive of the United States as being exactly like all other countries. But Jefferson's point was that we're different because we're a collection of societies. That's why it's the United States in the plural. That's why all throughout the Constitution, the United States is referred to in the plural to emphasize it's a collection of societies. It's not just a giant blob. So the compact theory holds that the United States consists of these states, that these states came together, sent delegates to the Philadelphia Convention, and it was these states that acceded to the union. It wasn't that there was the union first and then the states were created out of it. The states, of course, pre-existed the union. And we see evidence for the compact theory in, for example, the Declaration of Independence saying that it was a group of states that were getting their independence and that these states may you know, make war and peace and do all the things that states may of right do. Now, when the Declaration of Independence is speaking of states, it doesn't mean states in the sense of Massachusetts and South Carolina. It means states in the sense of France and Spain. That's the status that these states had in the world. And so, of course, they preceded the Union. There was no Union at that time. It was just this collection of states. Then we get the Articles of Confederation, and Article 2 there says that the states retain their sovereignty, freedom, and independence. Well, how are they going to retain those things unless they had them to start with? So we still have sovereign states even then. Then as the – and I might add, by the way, I sometimes point out that during the Revolutionary War, we see some of these states, even when they were still colonies, acting in ways in prosecuting the war that obviously indicated – that they were exercising sovereignty as states and not just uh, administrative units of a large blob. But we see the exercise of sovereignty in the way the war was waged, particularly in certain states. When in 1776, the laws pertaining to treason 
were being considered, it was concluded that treason would be conceived of as being carried out against the colonies individually as opposed to against a single blob. And I, I mention all this stuff. You'd think it would be obvious that before the creation of the Union, it would be obvious that you already had the colonies slash eventually states. And to some extent, of course, they'll all concede that in the abstract. But in practice, they don't really concede it, the people who believe in the nationalist theory. There are people who believe in what's called the one people theory of the union, that really there was always one people. And Upshur just blasted that out of the water. And of course, if there had been just one people, then they would have thought of treason as being committed against the one people, not against the colonies individually. So then we go into the Constitution. You may say, all right, Woods, well, all this stuff goes by the wayside with the Constitution because here, clearly, the states are being consolidated into a single unit. But in my book, I point out that the understanding of international law at that time was that a sovereign state could accede to some kind of confederation without actually compromising any of its sovereignty. It may voluntarily choose for some time to relinquish control over certain functions, let's say, and, and delegate them to some other institution. But that's not a compromise of its sovereignty. That's an exercise of its sovereignty. It's making the sovereign decision to do that, to let some other institution carry out certain functions. But it can recall those powers because it is sovereign. The people of that state are sovereign. They retain the sovereignty. They simply apportion their sovereignty between the state and federal governments, but they don't actually give up their sovereignty. Now, there is a lot on this subject in nullification. I mean, we can also note, by the way, the obvious that when the Constitution was ratified, did we have a single national vote of one indivisible people? No, it was ratified one state at a time. Why is that? Because the states were the constituent parts of the union. So this is what the compact theory is all about. And so, of course, if you believe the compact theory, then ideas like nullification and secession simply follow logically. These are simply the exercise of sovereign powers by a sovereign body. But if you believe in the nationalist theory, whereby the states are just mere administrative units of the center and are utterly subordinate to the center, then if a state nullifies or secedes, this becomes treason because they're, uh-oh, they're standing up to their overlords. That's treason, citizen. But the idea there would be that instead of thinking of these states as being sovereign bodies, and I mean, what makes something sovereign is the idea that they have the final say. There is nobody who can second guess them. They have the final say. But if you believe in the nationalist theory, these states are just arbitrary boundary lines. They're just arbitrary groupings of individuals. And these arbitrary groupings of individuals in refusing to abide by some federal command, why they are engaged in treason. But they're not just arbitrary groupings of individuals. The states are real. The peoples of the states are real. They have real histories and they have a, a long history of being sovereign, and of, uh, at the very least, of being independent of one another. So as I say, there's a lot about this in the book. I think chapter four of my book, Nullification, which covers the compact versus nationalist theory, is, I'm trying to think of how to say this without sounding like an arrogant jerk, I think it's the best presentation of this, best short presentation of this topic. And I say that simply because there are a lot of great long presentations of it, Abel Upshur's book being one of them. But I wanted there to be something that was accessible, that would pack in as much evidence as possible, and that people could get through without having to read a book-length treatment of it. So let me see. So chapter four, it's, well, it's okay. It's only about 28 pages. It's not that long. But that is... That's going to pack a punch right there. So we, we can also, by the way, go back to the ratifying conventions to find support for nullification. And here, uh, longtime listeners will know that I've relied quite a bit on the work of Kevin Gutzman, who has a great book called Virginia's American Revolution. This is drawn from his PhD dissertation material. 
in which he goes back and reviews the voluminous records of the Richmond Ratification Convention of 1788 and finds that there the Federalists, that is the supporters of the Constitution, it was not the Anti-Federalists, the opponents of the Constitution, but the supporters who assured Virginians that if the federal government should exercise any power beyond those expressly delegated, and yes, they used the word expressly, and yes, according to James Madison, the understanding of the people that they got from their ratifying conventions is the correct meaning of the Constitution, then Virginia would be exonerated. And there's a lot of good material on this. So again, these are, these are not anti-federalists. These are the Constitution's friends who were saying, don't worry, this is going to be an arrangement of 13 sovereign bodies, and don't worry if anything goes wrong, we as a sovereign body will be able to resist it. So the idea of nullification, again, was not just, wasn't created by me, it wasn't created by John C. Calhoun. They love to talk about John C. Calhoun. They do not want to talk about Thomas Jefferson because Thomas Jefferson, you know, basically wrote the Declaration of Independence. He's an iconic figure. They don't dare tell you that he is the guy who drafted the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798 that called for nullification. Um, geez, so much, I mean, I, I, I want to reproduce the entire book here, but I obviously not a good idea and would take 500 years to do so. But there is ample historical evidence for the idea of nullification. I do want to answer one counter argument, and that is the supremacy clause. There are people who say the supremacy clause proves that nullification can't be right because what we read in the supremacy clause is more or less this. This constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof shall be the supreme law of the land. And so this is taken to mean, well, the federal government trumps the state governments. But whoa, whoa, whoa. They are ignoring the words which shall be made in pursuance thereof. So it doesn't say this constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance of the constitution plus any old laws we might want to pass shall be the supreme law of the land. does not say that. They would never, no one would ever have ratified an idiotic document like that. Wouldn't have happened. These people who raise this argument are expecting us to believe that Thomas Jefferson didn't realize the supremacy clause was in the constitution. Does that sound plausible to you? So we have many, many quotations clarifying what this means. I'll just mention Roger Sherman saying that an excellency of the Constitution was that, quote, when the government of the United States acts within its proper bounds, it will be in the interest of the legislatures of the particular states to support it. But when it leaps over those bounds and interferes with the rights of the state governments, they will be powerful enough to check it. And then we get from the North Carolina Ratifying Convention, when Congress passes a law consistent with the Constitution, it is to be binding on the people. If Congress, under pretense of executing one power, should in fact usurp another, they will violate the Constitution. So notice, when Congress passes a law consistent with the Constitution, it is to be binding on the people. So notice he's, he's using in pursuance thereof. He doesn't just say any old law that Congress may want to pass. Why would he? Nobody would ratify a document like that. Interestingly, Alexander Hamilton himself said that the Supremacy Clause, this is in Federalist Number 33, the uh, Supremacy Clause, quote, expressly confines the supremacy to laws made pursuant to the Constitution. There are other quotations one might uh, cite, as I say, on this. I've got a link over at nullificationfaq.com that you can uh, click on and find more about this particular argument. Well, anyway, let's go and look now at some tweets I had to endure. A couple of them are from Renato Mariotti, who was, who's apparently a CNN legal analyst, so you know he's not going to know anything. And I know that sounds really arrogant, but it reminds me of what Eugene Genovese said. He was a Marxist historian for most of his life. He was a historian of American slavery. And then he started to have second thoughts about Marxism toward the end of his life because he was one of the few who looked at the piles of corpses and concluded that maybe something was rotten about the whole thing. But what Genovese said 
was that if you go to some little podunk Southern college and you start lecturing on Southern history, you're going to be called on every misplaced semicolon. But if you go up and speak to the Ivy League, don't worry, nobody's going to know anything. So it's in that spirit that I say this about law professors. It's because of the kind of training they get. All they learn is the nationalist theory. It's like they've never actually come into contact with the primary sources laying out the compact theory. They just don't know it. So Renato Mariotti, here's his insight. He says, nullification was a legal argument made by Southerners before the Civil War who believed their states could nullify federal law. That argument was discredited after their defeat in the Civil War, but it was made again by racists opposing desegregation. All right, well, if you want to, if you're competing for the award to see who can make this episode of history sound the most cartoonish, I would say this one's certainly in the running. All right, a legal argument made by Southerners before the Civil War who believe their states could nullify federal law. Well, the case I can think of would be South Carolina nullifying the federal tariff, 1832 to 33. But most of the, well, let's say, you you definitely see some kind of muted support for South Carolina, but not overwhelming for the stance South Carolina took. So I wouldn't say this was a legal argument made by Southerners in general, because that's certainly wrong. So that's definitely misleading. But what he doesn't note is that, in fact, the original Southerners who made the legal argument were in Virginia and Kentucky, and they were fighting against a law that attacked the freedom of speech. Well, we can't mention that because then that might make the nullification of such a law sound noble. So we'll just refer to mysterious Southerners who have no context or motivation. They're simply Southerners, and that we'll just leave it there. What he also doesn't point out is that it's Northerners who more frequently make reference to these ideas. They call these the principles of 98. And we hear this language in the protests being made in New England against what they considered unconstitutional searches and seizures in pursuance of the Jefferson embargo. Then we have Daniel Webster, who was such a union man. He had a famous debate with uh, Senator Hayne, but also an equally important debate with John C. Calhoun, in which Webster took a very strong pro-Union position. But even he said that if in the War of 1812 the federal government should attempt military conscription, then the states would have to protect their people by interposing between those people and the federal government. So uh, then we also see cases of the northern states, as we saw in the previous episode of this program, 1284, episode 1284, using the muscle of the states to resist the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. We talk about forms that that took. They made quite clear, and they used the language of state sovereignty, that they were defending their state sovereignty, that they thought it was outrageous, that the federal government thought it could be the judge of its own powers, and that the states needed to be a counterpoint to this. None of this makes an appearance. I am quite sure so-called Renato Mariotti knows none of this. Why would he? Where would he have learned it? Then he says that argument was discredited after their defeat in the Civil War. How? How is the compact theory of the Union discredited by a war? I mean, how could, is it possible that the Pythagorean theorem might have been discredited by World War I? This makes no sense. And as Bob Murphy puts it, you wouldn't say the cause of the Plains Indians was discredited by the U.S. Army. How are ideas defeated by force of arms. Either they're right or they're wrong. This is like dumb, 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 schoolyard bully dumb. Well, I clocked you over the head, so that proves you're wrong. What does that mean? I mean, that doesn't even mean anything. And then he says that racists use this idea. That's true. That's true. A lot of disreputable people have used a lot of honorable things. They've used the Bible. They've used Western civilization. They've used Aristotle. One could go on and on and on, all the things they've used. They've used the federal government. Federal government did all kinds of terrible things over the course of its history. And not to mention enforcing the Fugitive Slave Acts. How about that? But for some reason, when the federal government does outrageous things, this is never held against it. 
I mean, yeah, some progressives will oppose these things, but hey, you know, they'll say, look, nobody's perfect. But if the states do something that's wrong, well, that just goes to show they're stupid and backward and they need to be pushed around by the progressive federal government. So that's just a double standard. That's just a double standard. They can be ignored on this issue because they're not really serious. They're saying that bad people have used the powers of the states. Bad people have used the powers of the federal government. And if it's, if it's minorities you're worried about, a point I've made in a lot of my public speaking on this is look around at the world and, and look through world history of the past 100, 150 years and ask yourself, have large centralized states and empires always been safe places for minorities to live? Not every place has been like Austria-Hungary or the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so I've mentioned the example of the Armenians, for heaven's sake. I'm half Armenian myself. They lived in the Ottoman Empire. How did that turn out for them? I bet they would have preferred some decentralization. And you can insert other examples uh, into that line of argument as well. So there's that. Then we get this. I, I'm not, this is an actual tweet by this guy. This is CNN's legal analyst. He says, can you imagine if courts couldn't strike down unconstitutional laws? This is because Whitaker also apparently had critical things to say about judicial review, which is the process by which the courts review laws for constitutionality. Jefferson's view, by the way, was what was called concurrent review, that all three branches have a responsibility to uphold the Constitution and review laws for constitutionality. But anyway, he says, the government could pass a law imprisoning journalists and no court could review it. Well, all right, look, the government did pass that law. It passed that exact law in 1798. The Sedition Act of 1798 was the exact law this guy is saying, what would we ever do about if the courts couldn't help us? Well, we got that law in 1798, and guess what? The courts were of no help whatsoever. They were of no use whatsoever. Because you don't just, it's not like if there's a potentially unconstitutional law, the court just steps in and declares it unconstitutional. A case has to come before it. And there was no case. And plus, if there had, they had heard a case, the court would have ruled in favor of the violation of free speech. The court was packed with federalists. So, of course, the, the court would have supported the, the violation of the freedom of speech. A lot of good that would have done us. So where did the resistance come from? From the states. From the states. That's where the only resistance that could be found was found. Now, the New England states were all in favor of throwing journalists in jail and stuff like that if you criticize John Adams. So not all states, but some decent states at least resisted. So in, in other words, um, if you're really concerned that the federal government might do something outrageous, and that's why we need the courts. Well, what could it hurt to have a second level of defense in the form of the states? What, what could that hurt? Why not have both? But they can't because they just can't imagine the states doing anything except being doormats for the federal government. Then somebody else, I don't remember his name, but some Twitter commentator, they're all interchangeable, said, our acting attorney general is a, quote, literal Calhounist. Well, Calhoun is a guy we're not supposed to like, and that's why they always want to associate Calhoun with nullification, because that'll discredit nullification, because we all know Calhoun is a bad guy. I have an episode of this podcast where I ask the question, what should we think about Calhoun? And I'll link to that episode at tomwoods.com slash 1285. But what I think, just in brief about this, that's worth mentioning, is that you know who else were literal Calhounists, so-called? The northern abolitionists who used nullification and even quoted verbatim from the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798, they used nullification to fight against slavery, and they cited Calhoun by name. They were literal Calhounists. Hmm. I don't think Renato Mariotti knew that. And I don't blame him for not knowing it. It's not like um, our cultural elites go out of their way to inform us of it. But eh, given that his knowledge is obviously paper thin on this subject, you'd think he'd have the decency to just shut up. Just shut up. If you don't know more than four or five sentences about something, 
then don't go standing up as the CNN legal analyst and tweeting about it like you're some expert. Oh, so anyway, I got this off my chest. A lot, lot more that can be said about nullification and the real history of America, but you can find that over in my book, Nullification. And even if you don't think nullification per se is something you have like a long-term interest in, the book teaches you a lot of U.S. history. That's kind of the point. Here's the, the other side of U.S. history, the U.S. history that didn't get recorded or that you didn't know about. Governors standing up and saying, look, I'm going to stand between my people and the federal government to uh, protect them against X, Y, and Z. Stuff like that it is all in here and documents you've never seen before just to prove I'm not making this stuff up. It's eerie. It's eerie how this stuff has gone down the memory hole. And that's why I've no other book of the dozen that I've written have I ever felt compelled to include a documentation section. But I thought, what I'm saying runs so counter to what we're all trained to believe, I better really, really include a lot of proof. And so I did. There are a lot of pages of great primary source material in here. So anyway, Nullification is the book. I'll link to that book also at tomwoods.com slash 1285. Tomwoodsaudio.com is where to get yourself the free audiobook version. I think that's all I want to say. Oh, you know what? Let me say one other, one quick thing about an episode a few days ago that I did with Scott Horton. And we we bleeped out a word Scott said. I'm sure you could figure out what word it was. But just in case anybody's wondering, I don't do that because I'm a goody two-shoes. I, although I kind of am in some ways. But it's more a question of, as I've said before, I want parents to be able to listen to the Tom Wood Show while they're driving and not be wincing all the time, worried that some terrible language that their kids are going to imitate is going to come out of their speakers. I just don't want to do that to them. So that's why we keep it that way. So if somebody does slip, you know, nobody's perfect. We bleep it out mainly for that reason. It's not that I I think you're all too delicate to hear a four-letter word. It's for the sake of the children. Okay, and one final thing. Just remember, if you are interested in taking advantage of my website publicity offer that is ongoing at tomwoods.com slash publicity, remember that Black Friday which this year is November 23rd, uh, 2018, this is the best day of the year to get your hosting because the prices are the lowest. So if you were thinking of doing it the next few days, don't. Wait until November 23rd instead and go over to tomwoods.com slash blue and get your hosting then because you'll thank me because you're going to save some serious dough and I want you to save some dough. But... uh, the whole process, how you get your bonuses and stuff is over at tomwoods.com slash publicity. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>